Welcome back to Going Off, a Card Kingdom video series where we talk about all the latest and greatest Magic the Gathering cards. I'm Hallie Santo, and back for this episode are our friends Scott Cullen and Bradley Rose. Welcome back, folks. Thanks for having us. Hello. I'm especially glad that you two could join us for today's show because you two are pretty big Commander players, and that's going to be the topic for our show today, Commander 2021. We're recording this on Thursday, April 8th, right in the thick of Commander 2021 previews, and we're going to be talking about all of the decks that we've seen so far and all of our favorite cards from them. What do you guys think of these decks so far? I'm so excited. Uh, there's a lot of cool stuff that's been coming out. These decks are bananas. That's the best way I could describe them. It's just they're crazy. They're possibly, hot take coming now, but possibly my favorite commander product possibly of all time wow that's really high praise dang there's just so yeah. there's so much new stuff <laughs> they're so flavorful there's so many unique and weird ways like we'll obviously be talking about all these in a moment but there's just so many just awesome things that are in here i don't think i've seen another commander product so far that has grabbed me in the way that this has i'm not a commander player myself um at least not as much as i play other formats but honestly, a lot of the cards in these decks have inspired me to start building commander decks, and I guess I can touch on some of them as we go along. But I'm really excited to start brewing with some of these cards. Let's dig in. Yeah, let's dig in. And let's uh, let's start with the college that does the most digging. Uh, it's Lorehold, because <laughs> they're archaeologists. Uh, we saw Lorehold Legacies previewed this past Monday, and this deck is looking a little different from what we've seen from Boros in the past. It's not super aggressive. It's very focused on artifact synergies and artifact recursion. Mm. And I wanted to ask you, too, what uh, some of your favorite cards were. Top card probably being added for Commander here for me is Excavation Technique. So it's a sorcery that uh, features a uh, new mechanic that appears on a cycle of these. Uh, it has Demonstrate, which says when you cast it, you may copy it. If you do, you can choose an opponent to also copy it. Players may choose new targets for the copy. This one in particular for white, it says destroy target non-land permanent. Its controller creates two treasure tokens. So it's like a generous gift, but a different kind of gift this time. What you can do with demonstrate is have any other person at the table also get their own copy and you get, so they get two more ways to destroy things. So that's three things you can use in particular to maybe take down someone who's pulling far away in ahead when there usually is because of a bunch of strong synergies they have among permanents that you want to get rid of. I personally love demonstrate as a mechanic just to start. It just allows for so much dynamic play. Like the more effects like this that we see in any given game, the more nuanced those games and decks end up becoming. And even without the demonstrate part, this is just a very strong removal spell and can be very political if you choose to demonstrate with it like it won't feel anywhere near as bad as say reality shifting a commander or something at least if you destroy a commander with this you're giving them the two mana in the form of treasures in order to sort of repay for their commander tax yeah it's very much in the spirit of fairness which is mm. very on flavor for white speaking of cards with uh, a lot of different uses i was really impressed with cursed mirror in this deck. Um, it's a mana rock. It's a three mana mana rock that adds red. Um, but the turn it enters the battlefield, you can have it enter as a copy of any creature on the battlefield until end of turn, except it has haste. Um, and I think this is a really neat card because, you know, so often in Commander, uh, it's kind of a necessary evil to play these kind of mana rocks because you want to be ramping into your big explosive spells for late in the game. But if you draw one of these mana rocks when you're really far behind and maybe your opponent has a big threat that you need to deal with, it can feel really bad. And I think it's cool that this card has these different uses at different stages in the game. And that's always something that I look for in a card and always appreciate. Very much agree on the necessary evil of the, the mana rocks. So mono red decks... Uh, will maybe want to especially pick these up. I know mana rocks can double as fixers, uh, but if you're in red, uh, you might want to go and use uh, this instead of one of the usual two manas. Um, I personally think it would be really cool to copy, say, an Inferno Titan and attack with it right away, mm -hmm. so you just six damage comes out of nowhere as your mana rock. <laughs> it's pretty good. Red is full of weird effects like this, and every time they come up with a new one like this, I'm 
convinced i end up going onto scryfall and trying to find where they've put this kind of ability on a card before and i I can never find it they're they're always finding new ways of doing it like there hasn't (laughs) been a mana rock before until now that has like that copied something just on etv that's that's crazy. You would think that something like that would have been done already. When I first read it, I was like, oh, that's really cool. So, you know, you'll just copy something that you have. But I didn't realize that it's actually any creature on the battlefield. That's much stronger, significantly more powerful. You can copy a commander. You can copy a Elish Dorn. You can do anything ridiculous <laughs> for three mana. And then after you get it and you use it for the turn, you know, it could be a, could be a potential combo piece or you get a second... You know, like one of the things I want to do with it is get a storm kiln artist and Ooh. make a copy of it. So anytime I cast a spell, if it's a one mana spell, <laughs> I'm going up in mana. There's so many different things for this. It's it's mind boggling. Like I'm going to put this in any deck that I have that runs red, whether it's a good idea or not. I'm just, just going there now. <laughs> yeah. What other cards stood out to you from this deck? Monologue tax is two and a white for an enchantment. And whenever an opponent casts their second spell each turn, you create a treasure token. It's kind of like Smothering Tide's younger and less egregious cousin. I will admit, I'm not normally a huge fan of this kind of effect in general, but it is definitely better to have cards like this rather than preventative kind of cards like Rule of Law. And um, they tend to be less acceptable in more casual pods and that kind of thing so i enjoyed seeing i enjoy seeing cards like this because it does slightly punish your opponents for doing their thing but it doesn't stop them from doing it and i feel like that leads to much more enjoyable games overall and you're still gaining benefit from it which feels fairly fair like you said with excavation technique i feel like that's a very fair white kind of approach to it i feel like this is going to trigger a lot less often than smothering tithe also just because your opponent can't stop drawing cards or i guess they can stop drawing cards but it's a lot harder to stop (laughs) drawing cards than it is to stop playing two spells in a turn and when someone gets to the stage when they're playing multiple spells in a turn they probably don't mind giving you a treasure token um, if it's late in the game and everyone has a lot of mana anyway, but if you're in a deck that either can use that mana to play a really big spell, or if you have artifact synergies and the treasure tokens help with that, then it's a pretty big benefit. A- another card that also helps white out to ramp a bit is Archaeomancer's Map. Mm-hmm. When uh, it enters the battlefield, you can search for up to two basic planes uh, and get those into hand. And then whenever a land enters the battlefield under an opponent's control, if they control more lands than you, you can put any land card from your hand onto the battlefield. So for my uh, impression from here, uh, most of the time you'll get at least one trigger from the second one, but extra gravy if you get more uh, triggers, especially if you're playing against green. So it's essentially like a white cultivate. This is, in terms of design, it's very close to the best that I would expect from white when it comes to ramp. And I do think it is really, really good. It'll definitely help non-green decks in particular keep up with the rest of the table. And it fetches up two planes. That is technically card advantage in white. So we are getting places, everybody. We are getting places. (laughs) There are a surprising number of cards in this deck that give white some form of card advantage, whether it's uh, giving it, letting you get extra lands or actually letting you draw cards. I mean, we we also noted Secret Rendezvous is a is a new card in this deck. Mm. Um, one of the things I actually find really funny about Secret Rendezvous is that the art uh, features a Lorehold student and a Silverquill student, and this card is actually in both of the decks. It's in the Lorehold deck and the Silverquill deck that we'll oh. talk about later. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. That's spot so that. cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, but both that's, of those white decks get card advantage now, which is awesome. Yeah, that's I, that would be extra flavorful if you managed to play all the pre-cons together to only Secret Rendezvous with the other white deck. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, got to put that on your yeah. achievement list or your, your bingo card. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Let, let us know if you ever do that. Yeah. Something I like about uh, Secret Rendezvous is that I like playing Harmonize whenever I have green and no blue uh, for draw options. And if you're like me who likes playing Harmonize, and if you don't have a lot of other draw options, I would suggest giving this uh, a try. I know it gives your opponent uh, three cards, but not necessarily those three extra cards would go and take you down in a table uh, of Committer. could actually help out, uh, especially if another player is pulling ahead. So it is conditional on 
whether it's bad for you, but I would say most of the time, it's going to be good for you. I have seen some people and their initial reactions weren't super positive about this card, but I guarantee it's much better than it looks because drawing three cards by itself is great for three mana. And it is, yes, giving someone three cards, but it's only one other player. That is completely a trade-off that I'm willing to take because if you compare it to other cards, say like Windfall, you know, they often draw all of your opponents many times more cards than what you're actually getting out of it yourself. <laughs> and they see loads of play. Now, I know they're not perfectly comparable. They are two different effects in essence, but I really do think that the point still stands. This will become ubiquitous in white decks over time. I can I can feel it in my bones. I can tell. So when we last had Scott and Bradley on the show, we talked about Prismari a lot. You two talked about <laughs> how much you love Prismari College. And we got to see some awesome new Prismari cards this week. Uh, which ones were your favorites? Veyron, Voice of Duality. So Veyron, Voice of Duality is one blue and a red for a 2-2 legendary Efreet wizard with Magecraft. So whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, Veyron, Voice of Duality gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. And if you casting or copying an instant or sorcery spell causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger, that ability triggers an additional time. So it's kind of like a panharmonicon, but for casting spells. You're speaking uh, my language. I love this. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to say, I have a Jorian deck. Uh, Bradley, is that, you've actually played against it. And I have to say, Jorian, I'm sorry. It has been a blast, but it's it's time. Veyran is the most, quote unquote, me commander that has ever been printed. I want nothing more from a game of magic than casting spells gaining constant value and then just snowballing out of control with a completely full hand and full stack that's just music to my ears pun intended <laughs> this is going to just basically go directly into a blue red deck for me with all of my favorite cards like young pyromancer will trigger off of it thousand year storm will trigger off of it talrand you name it all of the cards that i love to play get affected by veyron it'll be getting double triggered from absolutely everything and I'll essentially be making a build your own combo deck and nothing appeals to me more. <laughs> wow, you've really sold me on this. I want to build this deck now too. <laughs> Couple cards that appeal to me uh, a lot the most out of this deck are the two refrain cards. Uh, one is called Inspiring Refrain. This one's a, a the blue one and it is a four blue blue for sorcery. You can draw two cards, exile it with three time counters on it and has suspend for three, two and a blue. So this this one is a kind of a sneaky inclusion for the high mana value matters uh, deck because if, if you include so many high mana value cards, you can't cast anything in the early game. This will help you get there. Over time, uh, you're gonna be wanting to cast like your big spells one turn and then maybe do some removal on the other turns. So this actually works out to be pretty okay for you to be getting an extra uh, influx of cards every now and then. As for the rousing refrain, this is the, the the pair here in which you can actually notice with the art, these are like the same musicians taking turns, mm. which is I think is extra cute and cool. Uh, this one, pay five for a sorcery that you add red for each card and target opponent's hand and until on a turn you don't lose this mana as steps and phases end. And exile rousing refrain with three time counters on it. Suspend three for one and a red. This is for the turn when you do cast your big spells. Uh, you're going to target someone. Hopefully they've been drawing a lot of uh, cards themselves. You're going to want to target those blue players uh, with this. Both of these cards are just music to my ears. I would love to uh, have a divination basically every three turns. In terms of how they play, I love how you can set up kind of a rhythm in the game itself. Like you can suspend the two of them for argument's sake on the same turn and they'll fire off together for a massive sequence in three turns time. Your opponents will have to set aside resources to deal with it or be in serious trouble. And that can almost feel like they're getting ready for that chorus to hit. So that kind of mechanics translating into a, a physical impact among the players like i love 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 that it doesn't yeah. normally fit within you know more competitive decks but more casual decks that want to have a deck feel something this is what i'm aiming for with those decks every time yeah the flavor of these cards is incredible 
Yeah. And speaking of flavor, the next card we wanted to talk about is a little bit of a meme, um, but we love cards like this. It's Octavia Living Thesis. Octavia is a, an elemental octopus. It costs eight blue blue. And the great thing is it's an eight eight, but if you're playing one of those kind of spell slinger decks where you have a lot of instants and sorceries in your graveyard, you can just play this for blue blue um, because it costs eight less to cast if you have eight or more instant or sorcery cards in your graveyard. <laughs> But the thing I love the most about this card is if you look closely at it, the number eight appears eight times in different places on the card. <laughs> you got to hit all the those eight notes. Um, <laughs> and, and if you look even more closely and you count the number of rules text, there's eight of them as well. Wait, there's there's eight. Are there eight lines of rules text on this card? Yeah, that was a, uh, a design goal oh <laughs> that I've learned from the uh, wizards. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. That's some great attention to detail there. Yeah, yeah. I, I certainly don't hate this card anyway. <laughs> uh, for, for real, perfect. For real though, perfect. it is a very strong mono blue commander by itself, even. Um, and I can also see it showing up in the likes of say like Talran Sky Summoner decks just to come down for blue blue, and then every time you cast a spell, you can turn one of your two two flying drakes into an eight eight. That's a pretty fast clock like that's a pretty good increase in clock uh i i would give it a solid eight out eight out of eight score perfect yeah all right so we're gonna move on to another blue deck uh from this set uh it's quantum quandrix um there's actually a, a lot of cards here that seem like they have some crossover between the quandrix deck and the prismari deck which seems really cool yeah. um and this is a deck that has a couple different things going on in it. Uh, it's making some tokens. It's also putting counters on things. What card stood out to you two from this deck? Essex, Fractal Bloom. Uh, what it does is it's a flying 4-4. Four, four. The first time you create one or more tokens during each of your turns, you may instead choose a creature other than Essex and create that many tokens that are copies of that creature. Something that I had thought maybe would be cool to do. Um, so you're going to look out for all your ETB effect creatures when uh, that you might want to copy. But what is cool is if you copy a creature that enters the battlefield and creates tokens because of that, like maybe a deep forest hermit mm -hmm. that creates four squirrel tokens when it enters the battlefield. But then Essex yeah. comes in and says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Instead of those four squirrel tokens, there are four more hermits. And then when those <laughs> enter the battlefield, each of those creates four, and now you get 16 squirrel tokens, and because the hermits give them plus one plus one, they're all six sixes. Yes, Essex, Fractal Bloom's ability, it feels like it was sort of foreshadowed in a way with Mystic Reflection from Kaldheim. It's very interesting because there was, for a very short period of time, a modern and pioneer deck that performed reasonably well by casting Mystic Reflection, targeting Master of Waves, to have the Master of Waves make copies of itself and then make a load of big elementals. So just like what you said, Bradley, in, with the Deep Forest Hermits or Deranged Hermits. Ah. So I think that's one of the first things I'll be doing with this for sure. A card that stood out to me from the Quandrix deck is Dika, Fractal Theorist. So it's four and a blue for a 3-3 legendary human wizard with Magecraft. Surprise, surprise. I'm all about those instants and sorceries again. Whenever you cast or copy an instant or sorcery spell, you create a 0, zero green and blue fractal creature token and put X plus one plus one counters on it where X is that spell's mana value. And then you can pay three and a blue to give target creature unblockable, um, basically. But it must be a token. So it's target creature token, can't be blocked this turn. I've got to be honest, they've really got to stop making mono blue commanders that I want to play with. This is so <laughs> easy to abuse. Take, for example, something like Treasure Cruise. If you were to cast a treasure cruise, say you delved away seven cards and cast it for one mana, you're still getting an 8-8 eight, eight token. But even better is if you use something like Narset's Reversal and target your own treasure cruise, you'll not only draw your three cards from the copy, but you'll make a 2-2 two, two from the Narset's Reversal and you'll make two 8-8s eight, for three mana because technically treasure cruise was cast twice and you'll still wow. have the treasure cruise in your hand. So you'll have a 2-2, two, two, and two eight eights and draw three cards. That's absolutely insane. This has to work pretty well with demonstrate, right? Because we've seen a number of demonstrate cards that have relatively high mana values. That's a great point. You're gonna want to include like twin cast and such for your big spells to just add on for a little mana, um, even more instances of tokens you'll get 
two tokens per copy spell that you cast. I, I've mentioned before, I haven't always been a big commander player, but I've played a lot of standard and I've played the card Shark Typhoon quite a bit in standard. <laughs> and this is basically yeah. like this is basically like Shark Typhoon the commander, um, where you just get a big creature anytime you cast a big spell. So I'm here for it. There was another legendary creature in this set that I thought was really intriguing, and that's Ruxa Patient Professor. It's a 4-4 for two green green, so pretty solid rate. Uh, when it enters the battlefield or attacks, you return target creature card with no abilities from your graveyard to your hand. Creatures you control with no abilities get plus one plus one, and you may have creatures you control with no abilities assign their combat damage as though they weren't blocked. So I was looking at this card and I was thinking to myself, like, in all the commander decks that I've played, I've always played creatures that have really cool abilities, or I've always seen other players just loading up on creatures with great abilities. And I was like, what do you what do you play with this? Like, how do you build around this? And then when we were putting together some notes for the show, Scott, you mentioned tokens, and that just completely blew my mind. And and green doesn't get like flying is a common uh, to- if it does have an ability, it usually it's flying on tokens. And uh, well, green's got a lot in, in, instead of flying, just a lot of size. Like very occasionally, I guess you'll see trample or like maybe vigilance or something. But yeah, a lot of green tokens are just big and beefy. So yeah, yeah. you could totally use those with this card. I feel like there are a small there's a small contingency of Eula Queen among Bears players that will be very very happy with this because they're all playing Grizzly Bear Tribal. Shout out to all you Bear fans <laughs> for sure. Speaking of shout outs to fans of certain tribal, we've got another one of these uh, sea monsters um, spawning Kraken, uh, which specifically rewards you for playing uh, sea monsters tribal. This is a Kraken 6 6. Whenever a Kraken, Leviathan, Octopus, or Serpent you control deals combat damage to a player, create a 9 9 blue Kraken creature token. It doesn't have trample, of course, it's blue or flying or whatever. So you're going to have to work for it, but that's okay because there are some ways in the sea monster decks that you might already have these that it can help out. If you cast Whelming Wave, that bounces everything except mm-hmm. for sea monsters. So goodbye, blockers. Um, or if you've got Serpent of Yawning Depths back in Theros Beyond Death, that's a serpent that makes it so that only your sea monsters can be blocked by sea monsters. So you can likely get through there. Although the popularity of Coma decks might give you a villain uh, to go uh, up against the Spawning Kraken. So our next deck is Silver Quill Statement, which is a deck that's all about working together, basically. Um, It's a very political focused deck. It has a lot of cards that encourage you to work with other players. And I'm curious what cards stood out to you from this deck. As the saying goes, hello, Felisa. (laughs) Fang of Silver Quill. <laughs> uh, this one is a Vampire Wizard White Black uh, Commander. Uh, it's 3 2 flyer. It's got Mentor. Uh, welcome back, Mentor. Uh, whenever a non token creature you control dies, if it had counters on it, create X Taf 2 1 White and Black Inkling creature tokens of flying, where X is the number of counters it had on it. So this one is really cool in combination with the uh, mentor mechanic. It augments the decks um, caring about uh, counters, but if you are attacking uh, with uh, Felisa and then your other creatures, Felisa has flying, could usually evade uh, ground attacks, but if you put a counter on your your ground creatures uh, and then they get blocked, Actually, that's not bad. Uh, If they die, now you got inklings to go along with the mentor counters put on them. It's, I think it'd be a great commander for any sort of aristocrats deck with a counter sub theme. I don't think that's something you'd normally see all that often with black white commanders. Uh, it also works quite well with Shale, Dean of Radiance, and Ambrose, Dean of Shadow on the back. They both have the kind of effect of having a counter sub theme with aristocrats, which is quite an unusual thing to get. I've seen a lot of people brewing around this with a lot of aristocrat style commanders i've seen a lot of people posting this card alongside some of the tasas um, from ravnica sets and trying to pair those up which seems really neat there was one thing i i did want to mention about this card which is which i think is really cool and that's that the mentor ability is on this card and as far as i know this is the only card with mentor in the set and i think it's really awesome Mm. that wizards thought to bring back a mechanic from a previous set 
in a small dose and in a very different context than we've seen it before. I think that's a really neat design choice and something that works really well for a commander product like this. I'm sure there's a mentor fan out there going, yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> a little a little bit of spice to consider Athria's Shroud Veiled uh, with this, which puts coin counters on creatures. And when those creatures die that have coin counters, they come back to the battlefield so that you can reuse them again. Oh. Uh, but then you'll get inkling tokens from your coins. Oh, right. Yeah, because Felisa doesn't specify what kind of counters they have to have. They don't have to be plus one, plus ones. They could be any counters. One commander that actually stands out from this deck for me is the mono black commander, Fane the Broker. So Fane the Broker is two and a black for a 3-3 legendary human warlock. And they've got quite a bit of text, so bear with me on this. So... You can tap and sacrifice a creature to put two plus one plus one counters on target creature. You can tap, remove a counter from a creature you control to create a treasure token, or you can tap and sacrifice an artifact to create a two one white and black inkling creature token with flying. And then finally, you can pay three and a black to untap Fane the Broker. So that's a mouthful. I really like the idea of a mono black commander that has multiple options like this, and every single option is really interesting and really unique so if you look at it in a certain way he sacrifices creatures for counters sacrifices artifacts for creatures and then sacrifices counters for artifacts which is a very cyclical kind of design they all kind of fuel each other in a way and i love to see that on cards i love how it the card enables itself over time now one thing i do want to point out with it is their ability to pay mana to untap them i'm very interested in this because that's so abusable that's very very easily abused it it gives me very strong sort of staff of domination kind of vibes except it's in the command zone absolutely i feel like something can can be done there something can happen maybe probably involving rings of bryhearth who knows another monocolor commander option in this deck is nils discipline enforcer Mm. uh it says the beginning end step for each player, you can put a plus one plus one counter on up to one of their creatures. And then each creature with one or more counters on it, doesn't have to be from Nils, uh, can't attack you or planeswalkers you control unless its controller pays X, where X is the number of counters on that creature. And it's a 2 2. It's, it's, so it's like a bit of a tax uh, on any creatures with counters on it. I thought it was actually kind of um, arch enemy against the Quandrix deck with all their fractals. They're like, Yes, a 7-7. Seven, seven. You're like, oh, you have to pay 7 to attack me with it. But you can go uh, you know, on your way if you attack someone else. It's kind of like a surgical ghostly prison that sits in the command zone. It's not quite my cup of tea, but it's a really, really powerful political piece that grows opposing creatures while deterring them from attacking you. Actually, now that I think about it, giving your opponents power and then convincing them to attack someone else doesn't really feel traditionally white in the color pie to me, but... You know, that's that's a tinfoil hat theory for another day. <laughs> yeah, at least it's doing the kind of traditional white thing of spreading everything around, making sure that everything's equal, or at least mm. trying to. You know, it's putting a plus one, plus one counter on one creature that each player has. So everyone gets a little bit extra power, but they just can't attack you, which is kind of sweet. I, will you uh, a tip to look out for is uh, make sure nil stays on the board uh, by the time you are looking at opposing boards and think you're safe uh, they can remove nils and then attack you with it so probably want to play some protection on nils yeah one last card we wanted to talk about from this deck is keen duelist uh, which is a human wizard my favorite creature type at the beginning of your upkeep, you and target opponent each reveal the top card of your library. You each lose life equal to the mana value of the card revealed by the other player. That's interesting. And you each put the card you revealed into your hand. So this is definitely giving me some Dark Confidant or maybe Dusk Mantle Seer vibes. Yeah, this feels like a Dark Confidant kind of effect for me. Obviously, I, I play an awful lot of modern and stuff as well. So that's my first sort of analog for this kind of effect. I really like the idea of playing Keen Duelist in a deck where you can manipulate the top card of your library. One of the mm. one of the commanders that stands out for me for that is Yuriko. You play a lot of manipulation oh. for the top of your library so that when you connect with Yuriko or another ninja, you reveal it and opponents lose life. This is a nice little piece where you can set up the top of your deck and then on your turn you can reveal it 
and it would be say something like a card we said earlier like a treasure cruise or something else that's very high mana cost and your opponent can't be too annoyed about it because they got a card out of the deal it might it might mitigate some of the feel bads of getting uh, clocked by ninjas repeatedly if your opponent does feel annoyed uh, by it still even though you gave them a card and they lost like eight life and they feel compelled to attack you luckily the other cards in the deck uh, have ways like nils uh, to dissuade them uh, from attacking you uh, anyway. That is going to do it for this episode of Going Off. And if you want to see the last commander deck, Witherbloom Witchcraft, you can tune into the pre pre release today from our friends at Loading Ready Run. That's at twitch.tv slash loading ready run. Go say hi to them. And if you see some cool cards that you like from either Strixhaven or from Commander 2021, you can go pre order them at Card Kingdom. We have all the products you're looking for. We have an entire page dedicated to Commander 2021 in addition to our page on Strixhaven, so go check that out. And if you want to catch previous episodes of Going Off, uh, you can check them out here on our YouTube channel. Be sure to sub to our channel for even more content. And if you enjoyed this video, be sure to give it a like and leave a comment and let us know what you'd like to see from future episodes of this show. Until we meet again, uh, I've been Hallie. I've been Bradley. And I've been Scott. And we'll see you again soon.